how often do you say, oh my gosh, I'm so bloated, or this heartburn is killing me, or what is wrong with me? I'm always achy and feeling terrible and any number of symptoms, and you don't even realize what is going on beneath the surface is very, very much related to your gut health. Gut health impacts every one of our body systems. And today I have on an expert, a friend, my personal naturopathic physician and a prolific author, Dr. Mark Stangler. Dr. Stangler, Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, Dan, great to be with you. Well, good to be with you too. I know you have, you're an expert in so many areas, but we've talked over the years about how much gut health impacts people, but I think a lot of women and men don't realize certain symptoms like autoimmune or different aches and pains can actually be traced back to poor gut health. So why did you write this book? It's called The Holistic Guide to Gut Health. Discover the truth about leaky gut, balancing your microbiome and restoring whole body health. So this affects everything. Yeah, well, I found it very interesting. If you look at nutritional medicine, functional medicine, holistic medicine, well, you'll find all the great traditions, they all emphasize gut health in terms of having full body health. And so I looked at the modern literature in the last five years up to date, and what I found was there was hundreds and hundreds of published studies in the mainstream medical literature mm -hmm. demonstrating that the gut really is the gatekeeper of the whole body. In other words, if you have a healthy gut, you're more likely to have healthy organ systems, healthy cells, you know, every system of the body. But on the other hand, if you don't have a healthy gut, then it not only gives you common digestive symptoms like you talked about, which, you know, almost 30% of Americans have on a mm -hmm. regular basis, uh, but you're susceptible to all sorts of systemic problems from autoimmune conditions to cognitive problems, uh, to joint and muscle problems. Um, all the organ systems of the body, I was able to demonstrate this, these connections have been shown. So they call it the gut access. So, you know, the gut access to the brain, to the skin, to the eyes, to the mouth, you know, to the bones. I mean, everything you can think of, surprisingly, they have found this access or communication network between the gut and the rest of the body. And so interestingly, I mean, we are constantly doing something multiple times a day, most of us, to impact that gut health. And that's what we're putting in our mouths, right? What we're starting at the beginning of this elementary system and how much does our daily diet what we drink what we eat impact that gut health yeah that typically is the number one factor some people stress you know very intense stress affects it more sometimes medications but for most people the vast majority of the time it's definitely diet related and so with the standard american diet with the processed foods, the artificial sweeteners, which have been in the news lately for damaging the microbiome, your yeah. gut microbes, um, preservatives, chemicals, you know, devoid of fiber, too high in sugar, bad fats. Yeah, this all leads to destructive effects on the on the gut. And what do you think? I mean, how many people who don't have any gut symptoms, what we would consider gut symptoms, the bloating, the... Um, you know, heartburn, GERD kinds of things, IBS, don't have those symptoms, but what percentage would you guess of our American population still has an unhealthy gut biome in general? Yeah, I've, I've completed thousands of uh, microbiome stool tests with patients over the years. I mean, it's pretty rare someone comes out very, you know, extremely well in those tests. Most people right. have what we call a dysbiosis and imbalance of the gut microbiome. And uh, virtually everyone we test does. Now, you know, the degrees is what varies. You know, some people it's mild, other people it's moderate, and others it's severe. But most people we test are usually in like in the moderate category. People with more serious illnesses, digestive diseases, you know, they're in the severe. So it's very, very common. And it sounds like it kind of becomes a slippery slope or a rolling stone that picks up momentum and symptoms get worse and worse and, you know, go into things like autoimmune issues or heart issues or all that. Now, we hear that term so much, leaky gut. Um, what is it? How many people have it on some level? And then, of course, let's get to solutions, because I, I know there's so much in the book, we can only cover so much in this little interview. But I'd love the 
viewers to walk away with a few key ideas of what they could do today to start on the road to a healthier gut. So what is leaky gut? Yeah, leaky gut refers to the small intestine, which is the size of about, depending what you know, study you look at, at least one tennis court in terms of surface area. Uh, because we have these projections called villi, which increase the surface area in our small intestine. And that's where the vast majority of the absorption of our nutrients takes place. Mm. And so if leaky gut, again, the small intestine really is this gatekeeper, the entryway to the body. And so it should regulate what gets into our bloodstream, you know, the proper nutrients we need, uh, mm. be able to produce energy, carry out all the functions in the body, and then prevent the things that shouldn't absorb, large molecules, certain types of metabolites of bacteria. Obviously, things which can poison the system, toxins, you know, bacterial toxins, things like that. So with leaky gut, because of diet, because of chronic use of medications like the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the Tylenol, the ibuprofen and all that, uh, because of high stress, because of antibiotics, a lot of people have leaky gut. And so this gatekeeper is not working properly. And so we're absorbing things into the bloodstream we shouldn't. And then the immune system, as it, you know, should should respond, sees them as foreign invaders, and you get an inflammatory reaction. And really you get two things happening. You get the local inflammation, which can cause all sorts of digestive symptoms, road the lining of the small intestine, and but you get systemic. And they have this fancy word called translocation, which just means these toxins which absorb into the bloodstream, then go to various parts of the body. It could be the brain, it could be the heart, it could be the joints, muscles. And then your immune system has that inflammatory reaction to wherever you know, these toxins translocate to. And that's why you can get, you know, autoimmune conditions or joint problems or brain fog and all these things because of leaky gut. So this has been demonstrated literature to be absolutely true. It's all over the mainstream literature. Most doctors really aren't aware of it. They think really only sick people get it. People get really bad Crohn's disease and things like this. But that mm -hmm. just isn't a fact. As a matter of fact, it is something we test with patients. You can do a stool test or even blood test. You can actually see um, the degree of, of leaky gut with people. It's very, very common. Wow, that's a, it's a, it's almost like when that gut starts leaking, uh, little little garbage men are dumping garbage in all different organs potentially in your body, and without the means to mop up the mess, uh, things start to go awry. True, and you know, and God's designed our small intestines so it does auto repair. So we have like a natural mucus layer in the lining of the small intestine, which protects us. Uh, we actually have stem cells deep within mm -hmm. our small intestine. And so when damage occurs, these stem cells rise up and they actually repair. You can repair your whole small intestine within two to three days because of these stem cells. But because people are continuing to eat poorly, because they're not handling their stress, or they're taking medications that are constantly damaging, this prevents the repair from occurring. And then you have that leaky gut, which then leads to systemic problems beyond the gut. Because it's just gone on for so long. It is right. miraculous how beautifully God has designed our body to heal. And yet our responsibility is to put in the, the nutrients and, and take out the things that are damaging it that we have control over and put in the things. So where do you start with, um, let's just say the average person who's not having horrible, you know, systemic issues, but clearly has a leaky gut issue. Where do you start them um, on a protocol to heal that gut quickly? Yeah, well, we just tell them the truth. First of all, it has to start with diet. Most of our patients, if it's something they can do and most can, we use what's called a modif modified Mediterranean diet. So it's a Mediterranean diet with fruits and vegetables, you know, uh, whole grains, unless they have gluten sensitivity. Uh, some legumes, olive oil, you know, and fish, cold water fish, smaller mm -hmm. amounts of poultry, you know, small to restrict amounts of red meat for a period of time. And studies have been shown that the Mediterranean diet does help the microbiome, the good bacteria to flourish, does help heal up leaky gut. And if you look at the research, I mean, actually, the number one thing which has been studied in terms of leaky gut very precisely actually is gluten. So wheat, rye, and barley, they have done studies um, where even just one serving, for people who are sensitive to it, they showed an increase in leaky gut. So if you're a person who has celiac disease, which, you know, is less than 1% of the population, still very serious, but more people, and depending on what study you look at, I've seen various studies, perhaps 25% of the population has some degree of gluten sensitivity. So we restrict the gluten for a period of time until the gut heals up, and then they're usually able to rotate it. So we do that. 
Number two, we will put them on nutrients which heal the gut lining, shown in studies. We'll use aloe vera extract. Mm -hmm. We'll use DGL licorice. We'll use uh, vitamin A, vitamin D, and zinc. Those are used by the body to heal up the lining of the gut. And so when we do this and people are following their diet, yeah, you can get uh, pronounced improvements within one to two months. That's wonderful. So how does this impact the, the gut biome in general? I mean, people can have a disrupted gut biome. Do you call that dysbiosis? Yes. Um, so a disrupted but gut biome without having leaky gut, or does it always go hand in hand? I mean, usually when you have, like you said, the microbiome imbalance, it usually definitely contributes to a leaky gut. I mean, okay. that, that certainly is true. The main thing we're seeing in Americans now, actually, is something called SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, which is a type of microbiome imbalance. And this happens in people who have been on like the PPI medications for acid reflux. Yes. You know, that study show that predisposes you to having the SIBO. Uh, people who've had food poisoning in the past, sometimes there's damage to the nervous system. And so the natural wave-like contractions for the bowels to eliminate eliminate, you know, the waste products aren't working properly. So what's happening with SIBO actually, it's, it's very strange for people to first hear this, but you're getting bacteria from the colon coming up into the small intestine that shouldn't be in the small intestine. And as a result, common symptoms would be gas and bloating, sometimes nausea, brain fog, things which affect you systemically. But in essence, the point being is this imbalance in the microbiome is uh, inflaming, disrupting the small intestine lining, leading to leaky gut. So they often do go hand in hand. Okay. And so is it the same type of protocol to heal or to, to recover or whatever, the SIBO from the SIBO? Is there a... SIBO can be a little bit different. I mean, there's only one way to really test it in people. It's there's breath tests. You got to collect mm -hmm. some breath samples to get sent to a lab. And, you know, if you're fermenting, uh, this type of bacteria create gases, actually, like methane and hydrogen and hydrogen oh. sulfide, which you measure in the breath. Um, there are herbs you can take to get the levels down. Uh, there's even some certain antibiotics you can use. We don't use those, you know, as a first line of treatment. Um, but in general, yes, the same type of diet, healing up the lining of the gut. And I should point out, uh, and I think you're kind of alluding to this, they have shown in studies that the good microbes in the gut, they create signals to the lining of the small intestine to create that natural mucus layer, which is important for a healthy lining of the small intestine. So there is this like interaction between the two for sure. Okay, so let's go deeper into this whole thing of the, the healthy gut biome, prebiotics, probiotics, how much should come from food. Um, it's my understanding foods like high sugar, processed foods actually promote more of the unhealthy bacteria. So if we're really wanting to heal quickly and also stay that way, on top of that foundationally good diet, good stuff in, bad stuff out, what do we do supplement wise or even extra foods to, to promote? Yeah. Well, at the beginning when people aren't doing well, we'll certainly put them on probiotics, which we have human studies on them, just help people recover quickly and they can work well and generally do work well. You know, the gas bloating, the stool, constipation, things like that. But what we find for the long run to maintain a lot of probiotics, not all of them, but a lot of them, they do help the they do help patients while they're taking them. But we find with the testing for a lot of people, they don't hold. In other words, you're doing better as long as you're taking them, which is okay because they're non-toxic. But we don't find that they really hold within the gut. And that's why, like you said, the diet with prebiotic foods. So foods such as whole grains, again, unless you're gluten sensitive. That feeds the good bacteria in the gut. We know there's very good studies on like artichoke uh, and artichoke extracts. Those feed the gut. Garlic onions, those are prebiotics. They feed the gut bacteria as well. So we want to get these in the diet. And then, of course, we want to get cultured foods, which are a direct source um, of the probox or the good bacteria. So that'd be like yogurt, for example, sauerkraut. There's other fermented foods, you know, that people can eat. So um, that's what we try. That's what we do with people, which is definitely helpful. Okay. And is that something people need to ingest on a daily basis or a few times a week or? Yeah, even like three to four times a week, it'll make a big difference over a period of a few months. Start adding sauerkraut to your, some of your, your meals, et cetera. <laughs> okay, great, great. What other things do you cover in the book that 
kind of the average person doesn't maybe know, but can really help their overall health? Well, what we show in the book is if, if essentially you have any chronic disease. So again, mm. if you have an autoimmune condition, maybe autoimmune thyroid problem, maybe it's a joint problem, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, lupus, all these types of things. There is a very strong connection in the literature between leaky gut, uh, dysbiosis, and then having basically all the chronic conditions, especially the autoimmune. 70 to 75% of your immune system comes from your gut, right in that small intestine area. So if your immune system is reacting to all these toxins you're absorbing through, um, you're revving the immune system up, which is causing problems uh, for people with autoimmunity. So what we tell people, if you have an autoimmune condition or any chronic health condition, you should at least in part be treating the gut to get the best improvement, or at least for prevention. So let's just say, even from a, a natural perspective, let's say you have some joint problems, um, or let's say you have a thyroid problem, whatever it is, and you're taking things specific for that organ. That's fine, you'll improve to improve function. But if you're not addressing the underlying problem, the leaky gut, you're still not really getting to the real source of why you may be having problems. Interesting. How does that relate to Hashimoto's, which is the most common form of thyroid dysfunction? Yeah, in the book, we do talk about that. They have done research between leaky gut and Hashimoto's. And so it is one of the triggers as to why the immune system is getting heightened with Hashimoto's. Now, with that condition, research is pretty clear. There's a strong genetic component to it, mm. but there seems to be triggers. And so in the literature, triggers are things like leaky gut, uh, eating gluten if you're sensitive to it, and um, candida overgrowth. There's some research on that. That's yeast overgrowth in the gut. And mm -hmm. vitamin D deficiency. So we're always trying to, you know, address the triggers as to why someone's Hashimoto's may be a problem. Awesome. Well, let's talk just for a moment about the toxins. You're, you've mentioned several times all these toxins that come into our bodies that disrupt gut health. And specifically, the ones that we have more control over, maybe we, we're not always aware, but I'm thinking of, I don't, I don't know if this is one of them, but just the phytoestrogens in plastics, or how are those affecting um, our gut health? And what are some of the common ones we can, we can at least be more conscious to eliminate or minimize in our intake? Yeah, good point. Well, there's several, you're, you're right. You know, we have um, the xenoestrogens, you know, the compounds like in plastics and pesticides, which mimic estrogen in the body. They not only cause hormone balance, but do create disruption in the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, whenever possible, organic foods, especially the soft foods, you know, not things which don't have a hard, things which have a hard covering you don't have to worry so much about. Um, we know now there's emerging research on uh, Roundup or glyphosate yes. uh, in the gut. And now with there, there's some literature that I talk about in the book where that may be one of the key reasons why so many people are reacting to uh, gluten. Uh, because now they have shown that the immune system recognizes uh, gluten similar to glyphosate, and so it's cross-reacting uh, oh. to um, to gluten from the glyphosate in the foods. Interesting. Is that why when we go to Europe so often, when they where they grow things organically and much more healthfully, we can handle some of these breads and pastas that we can't handle in America? It's a very good point. I I have noticed that over the years. I've had many patients say go to Italy. Even people with, and I didn't advise this, even people with celiac disease. Really? Okay? And they go over and they have pizza and bread and said they have no problems. Whereas here in America, maybe they could flare up for weeks because of it. Many people with gluten sensitivity, no problems. I did look into this for my book. And lo and behold, it was true. I did, I did find in Europe they have much stringer requirements for what can be in foods in terms of chemicals uh, compared to America. So, yes, their grains are much cleaner over there in terms of like the glyphosate and other chemicals. So. There, there very well could be something to that. I love how you've detailed this in the book that these are holistic ways to heal. It, it's very sad, but today in so much of our traditional medicine, the first thing that happens is we get a pharmacological uh, response from our doctors to, you know, as you said, with, with GERD, we're given, the even if they're over the counter, um, drugs to are they called the PPIs? I think you called them yeah. um, to bring down that that what is it? Does it bring down the production of acid? Is that what they actually do? Which is a counter. Yeah, it, does. it inhibits the uh, production of stomach acid, um, 
which, you know, if someone's having a really bad problem short term, okay. But here's the thing. Stomach acid has several um, effects in the body. Obviously, it helps to break down protein. It helps to liquefy all food. It prevents parasites and other bad bugs from getting into the digestive system. And it's involved in absorption of many nutrients like calcium, magnesium, D, vitamin C, folate. And so this is why people who take those PPIs on a long-term basis, studies show, are much more likely to have like dementia because they can't absorb B12. They get bone loss because they can't absorb their calcium, their vitamin D, their magnesium. So these are risks with long-term use. But you no, know, it's interesting. Most people who have like stomach inflammation, gastritis, a little bit of acid reflux, most people, the vast majority of these people do not have excess stomach acid. What's going on with them is the natural mucus layer called the mucin layer has been eroded from their diet, from stress, maybe antibiotics, um, pain medicines. And so in natural medicine, we reestablish that natural mucus layer with proper diet, with the probiotics, with the DGL licorice, aloe, things which have been studied. And so we're working at a different level in terms of you know people having these, these issues. Yes, so that we're not just treating that uncomfortable symptom, but we're getting to the core of why we're feeling it, which promotes health and not disruption. I mean, if if what a great motivator to get off the PPIs, but you know that it affects your brain health and in so many other systems. Um, so thank you. Well, Mark, I'm excited that you've written this book. It is out and available. Um, probably any online bookseller you're interested in, Amazon. But uh, you've also created a very special website called gutsoothe.com, G-U-T-S-O-O-T-H-E.com, where people can get more information. You are always so helpful and so so practical and i'm so thankful well i'm thankful you're my naturopath but i'm also thankful that you share your knowledge with so many people because i think this book can be such a great primer who doesn't need a little bit of help in the gut area unless you're eating perfectly and who eats perfectly right so yeah. thank you so much for writing this thank you for taking the time to share some of the the nuggets from this new book the holistic guide to gut health with dr mark stangler thanks mark